Hi, I'm Oyang Tang. I'm joined here with my colleague and friend Jason Ross uh, of the Basement Research Team. He has just completed a two-part video series, and if you haven't seen that yet, I would highly recommend that. This is going to be our topic of discussion today. Uh, the video series covered the works of uh, Bernard Riemann and uh, the implications for economics and really, as you point out in, in the videos, everything from epistemology to theology. And that's what we want to maybe elaborate today for those of you who have seen these videos, which I think are a real breakthrough in terms of condensing the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche, which he's developed over the last, uh, well, over his entire lifetime. And uh, so the relevance is, I think, should be clear for people who have actually seen those videos. What we want to do is maybe uh, kick it around a bit more because it's always worth, uh, you know, elaborating these things. Um, so, Jason, my first question is: Do you have any uh, riddles for us today? Ooh, no, just kidding. We can we'll we'll let, we'll let you think about that. And okay, you, you can come back at the end if you have one. But All right, I'll think. Uh, maybe the place to start <laughs> is uh, where where you started on the first video is taking a look at the history of this concept of potential and where it's where uh, how that first came uh, to be, how, where that, coin was, that term was first coined by uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss and where it went from there. Okay, well I think the, the important thing about potential is that it lets you look at a process as a whole. In particular, it came up with looking at things like magnetism and gravitation and, and other things that had been treated as a bunch of individual parts acting on each other and causing an overall effect. The way Leibniz first approached it and the way Gauss really developed on it was to look at objects not interacting with each other, but interacting only with the entirety. Mm -hmm. So that, that would go, that goes in every respect. So uh, the example I used in the video was a comet coming into the solar system and instead of being pulled on by all the planets, it was just moving through the shape of the solar system the same way uh, you might roll a ball in a, uh, in, a, in a cleverly constructed mini golf hole or something like this. <laughs> All right. And similarly, the comet would, would act to the extent that it would, might act on things like a small asteroid the same way, not by pulling on them directly, but by changing the context that the asteroids exist in. Now, so, I mean, up, up to the point that Gauss first wrote his, his paper on potential, some, I think it was 1840 or thereabouts, uh, the concept of Newtonian forces acting at a distance had been kind of the dominant paradigm in physics, right? Yeah. And this is now taking this out of the domain of, uh, you know, point masses acting on each other according to the inverse square and doing what exactly? You're saying now this idea of potential is, as a, is it a, an abstra a mathematical abstraction or is it mm. something that actually has real substance? No, that's, that's a very good point because I was actually thinking in making some of the animations for, for the video that when I was showing how potential worked, at a certain point I... Uh, in doing it, I broke down and just used a bunch of forces acting on each other. Oh, and oh. I, I felt a little bit strange because I'm trying to make a point about potential and then I'm using the forces. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, the way we usually would ever use potential, a lot of the math ends up coming out to being very similar to just calculating the forces. But part of that, as, um, as Sky had pointed out, was because computers have a digital approach. Mm -hmm. That if you were able to make an a real analog, uh, a, a computational system that was analogous to the process that you're studying, that potential could be directly represented as potential. Hmm. So it sometimes seems almost like an abstraction or an aid to thinking as opposed to a real thing that's taking place out there. But I think a lot of that is an artifact of the way we, we do that sort of work today. But mm -hmm. it's it's not just a People before Gauss had sort of used it as a, as a mathematical tool, um, but for him it was, it was a real thing. Okay. Now, where does that take us now up to um, what came to be called Dirichlet's principle? I think it was Riemann himself that actually termed, yeah. ma made, you know, called it that. It wasn't Dirichlet himself. Um, and uh, I guess we should just point out also that, that those three figures uh, each successively occupied the, the uh, mathematics chair at Göttingen. University, so they were, um, I guess, uh, uh, successors of each other in a very close uh, intellectual uh, dialogue, um, and contemporaries at least at certain points overlapping. So, uh, where does 
Gauss's work then bleed over into Dirichlet and Riemann like, uh, in each successive generation? Well, they're very, they're pretty similar. I mean, Dirichlet gave lectures on potential. Um, we have available the notes from those lectures so we can get a sense of what they were like, what Riemann was sitting in. And what Riemann called Dirichlet's principle, I think he named it that not so much because it was a totally unique idea to Dirichlet, but because Dirichlet was teaching the classes, okay. so he associated <laughs> it with them. <laughs> Extra it, credit. Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't think it was brown nosing. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it was, Gauss had already had pretty much the same idea. The, mm -hmm. the idea behind it, behind Gauss's principle, well, that's not its official term, and Dirichlet's principle is that you can understand things by what determines their activity rather than by having what's called an expression or a formula for it. Uh, that might sound kind of abstract. The way Gauss applied it was in looking at Earth's magnetism. He had come to the conclusion that it was actually impossible to get a sense of what the magnets inside the Earth were like because any kind of magnetic configuration in the Earth, you could have just put a bunch of magnets right in the crust and you would never know the difference if you were walking around the Earth, you know, taking measurements and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that might sound pessimistic, but Gauss took it to mean, well, stop going down this useless path and let's investigate how a magnetic field works as, as a field. You're saying the useless path of trying to deduce from the magnetic measurements what the actual, uh, what kind of giant magnet was actually inside the center of the Earth, the yeah. nature of that magnet. Yeah, Gauss showed that you just, you just were never going to find an answer that way, okay. uh, not one that you could ever verify. So, uh, so it, sort of, it made the case that a field can be studied as a field, as an entirety, as a whole magnetic field. Hmm. Um, Dirichlet's use of it in his lectures it wasn't where Riemann ended up taking it. You know, Dir Dirichlet's lectures, he says something pretty similar, which is that if you're in an empty area, so an area devoid of masses or electric charges, let's say maybe a, you know, a cave deep within the Earth, um, if you were to make measurements all along the surface of that cave, that there'd be no surprises inside it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be shocked to find that over here your compass points in an unexpected way, that it's all determined by the surface. Riemann was really excited about that, not to use it for electricity and magnetism, although he did, but in trying to just do something very similar to what he did in his habilitation dissertation, which was to just kick mathematicians in the ass. And, and really, uh, the way he used it, he's, he said, look, a lot of mathematicians, they like to study ink on a piece of paper, that they get so mm -hmm. into symbols and whatnot that it's just totally divorced from the real world and it becomes like magic rituals. So what he used Dirichlet's principle for was to say, if you know what determines the way something works, that those conditions that determine it, that's a fine definition for it. You don't have to have a formula or, you know, some, yeah, you don't have to have a formula or an expression for it. If you know everything that determines something, you know it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to, to, I think, consider that Riemann is a, uh, a thorn in the side for people who want to hold on to pure mathematics as pure mathematics um, because uh, I think it's probably most clear in his unpublished writings, his so-called philosophical mm. fragments, that uh, he really did take, I think, the, the concept of these mathematical works, these higher functions, you know, higher geometries, um, and treat them as investigations into the nature of human thought process itself that there's something substantive in the way in which you're investigating a subject in which, and he had a term, he called it Geistesmassen, thought masses or thought objects, that, uh, you know, that this, these would have to be expressed in your physical investigations because at the same time he was involved in looking at, as you mentioned, electricity, magnetism, gravitation, light, all of these things. Um, so it, it sort of uh, calls to mind this interesting conflict uh, and, and uh, coherence between, you know, physics and mathematics, especially in this, you know, specific time in history. You had all of this, th these uh, amazing investigations into, uh, again, these fundamental so-called forces of nature, uh, but at the same time trying to develop a language. And that seems to be a major aspect of this is not simply did you get the, the right answer for a particular problem, but what's the way in which you're developing the language uh, for investigations in general, for science, 
scientific investigation in general? Maybe, I mean, you seem to, to take this up from, I mean, the way that you t treat it in the videos is from the standpoint of metaphor. That, that metaphor is something which is absolutely essential for scientific investigation. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, there is no real separation between the way the universe outside of us works and the way our mind works. And a lot of times what's been pushed, especially by Bertrand Russell and other terrible people like him, is the idea that if a thought seems like it's about the way the mind works, that it can't be about the way the universe works. Mm -hmm. You saw that with Fermat, with the idea that least time is a, a mental construct, it's a human idea, it's an intention, therefore nature can't possibly work that way. And I think it's important what, uh, what Riemann and others did with this, with, uh, with metaphor, is that you've got, it, it's kind of like final causes. I think, in that you're able to express something not in terms of how each moment leads into the next, but by where you're going to go. So if, if you take, for example, Kepler's universal theory of gravitation, he doesn't, in his harmonies of the world, give any way for a, a major third to uh, a major six and a minor six to push on Earth and Venus. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got an idea about where, where the whole system is heading, and that intention itself guides it. So that you end up saying what something is by what it does or where it's going. Mm -hmm. it's, we had a discussion earlier today you know, in the basement where this came up with biology versus chemistry, that too many biologists are intimidated by physicists or chemists. And they say, well, that's, you know, that's rigor. In physics and chemistry, that's how things really are. And in life, we're being flimsy until we can give everything a chemical basis. When really what it points out is that sometimes the right question is asked in life when you ask not what is life, but what does life? What does life do? You're, ch you're changing the verb. Yes. And you're changing the idea of what, what an existence is. Because, you know, you get away with it in chemistry. You might say, well, this element is this way. The nucleus is this. And you've gotten away from what they do. And they've sort of become objects that exist on their own, which they don't. Mm -hmm. you know, none of them are sovereign actors. So when in biology, it's unescapable to ask, well, what does this thing do? What does life do? You know, the whole approach that Bernanski has, that, that, that really stands out against this reductionist approach that's you know, seemingly taken over the other fields, chemistry and, and physics, mm -hmm. where it seems like is is more important than does, and it's the only thing that that can exist. It always seems to come up <laughs> where people treat, I mean, where Riemann was attacked on his use of Dirichlet's principle uh, from the, you know, the side of the pure mathematicians was exactly along this issue is uh, instead of treating something as a, a process of hypothesizing and considering what's, what's the nature of the hypothesis itself, that the hypothesizing itself is a, is a substantive act, um, they say, no, you, you object on the grounds of, of what the, uh, the ab you abstract something, call it an object, and then argue over whether or not that object fits your definitions for what, you know, what, what you've already defined that an object has to fulfill to be an object. Instead of actually sort of recognizing that there's a, uh, that the, the investigation has the aim of, the, of any scientific investigation is not to come to the final answer. And uh, I wonder, in this realm, in the things that you've been looking at and treating in these videos, um, they seem to concern the nature of the question of existence. How do you know that something actually exists? How do you know that, uh, you know, how do you define something as having an actual efficient existence? Can you say something about this, this idea of, uh, of what, what the nature of an existence proof in mathematics like this, uh, like Gauss's fundamental theorem, what, what it, how we should <laughs> actually treat these things? Sure. I mean, I think that a lot of uh, university professors in, in physics or math might have trouble with showing that they exist. <laughs> because if, if you try to start from, like, t take the activity of the human species. Now, if you try to define how the human species acts, you know, you're gonna, you might say various things about us, but the fact that we are always, well, the fact that over time we have consistently 
changed our relationship to nature, changed our power in nature, changed our ability to, to understand and frame new hypotheses about it. We've increased the potential population density of the human species. That's something that's happened. So if you're trying to make a model for economy or for the social sciences and you try to build up your idea of the human species and then that's not in it, then something's just missing. It's like somebody who does an experiment, finds something new that occurs, and then tries to prove at the blackboard that they could have seen it. Mm. I mean, the mm. proof is that they saw it. They did the experiment, it came up, and then you know they're asked under peer review or whatnot, okay, well, how did how, prove that you might prove that this was possible to have been seen? Mm -hmm. you say, well, it, it occurred. Well, but how? I don't know yet. Well, you're not going to get published if that's all that you say. So, I think you have to start uh, with you know as Vernadsky would. You got to start with what what changes have occurred that couldn't find their origin in any of the causes that you presently believe can exist, and then you've already got in mind a new thought of whatever it was that caused that outcome. Hmm. So you see it with people. You say, well, other living species, there's evolution. It takes a very long time. You know, new biological technologies develop, et cetera, warm-bloodedness, things like that. But then if you say, well, what is it that we do? You know, what is the human process that's changed us as if evolutionarily, but in an incredibly short period of time. So maybe you just attach a word to it, like creativity. But you know that there's something there because you're unable to explain it with anything else that you already have. So you just, you just, you know that something is there. You get a smell of it. Mm. And then you have to approach, well, what, what is this thing? What is this strange animal that I'm tracking? What does it do? Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's left a, you know, you f it's like you found tracks with some, some strange shaped foot you've never seen, or droppings that look very unfamiliar if you're a, mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't Smell know. Smell unfamiliar. Yeah, you know, if you're a skilled, uh, you know, if you're skilled at looking at that kind of thing, you mm -hmm. might realize, what animal created this? Uh, and that, that's your tip off, that there's something, there's something else there. So you know it's there. You can't say what it is, but you know it's there by what it did. That you, you couldn't, something occurred that couldn't have occurred by any of the means that you know of. So something is there. And so you got a preliminary name of just the thing that did that. Mm -hmm. and that's all you can call it at first. You can find out more about it, maybe give it a better name later, but it's, it always starts as the thing that did something new. Well, I guess we can leave it there, huh? Unless you've got any riddles that you've thought of in the last 15 minutes. Um, I remembered a couple. I don't know how good they are, but... Uh, Okay, well, we'll keep people on the edge of their seats then. Okay. <laughs> Sounds maybe like the, a maybe good the idea. next video. All right. Okay. Thanks for watching.